Thank you, musicians. Thank you. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, open them up to Mark chapter 14. We are nearing the end of Mark. Some of the best films of all time usually involve a betrayal of some type. Uh, the best comic book movie ever made of all time, without any question, is The Dark Knight, the DC film. <laughs> It's the best. It's the best. Heath Ledger plays the Joker. It's an insanely good film. Uh, it's really good. But there's this great betrayal in that movie where Harvey Dent, the great uh, local district attorney, he turns dark and he becomes the great villain Two-Face. And it's, uh, it's one of those, those moments in the film that just twists and, and you're thinking, oh man, but if you read the comics, you knew that was coming. Uh, one of the, the greatest moments of treachery of any movies in the last, uh, I think, 30 years happened in The Lion King. Many of us saw The Lion King, where Scar betrayed Mufasa. And what a horrible moment that was in that film. But I don't think any betrayal in film comes close to what happened in the best sci-fi movie of all time. Here we go. Let's see if this goes over well. The best sci-fi movie of all time is the film The Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars, Episode Five. All right? All right. The nerds are happy. Okay. It's the, in the film where Han Solo is betrayed by his dear friend Lando Cal, Calrissian as he goes to, like the, and some of you know the film, I'm trying to say it w right, he goes to Cloud City on the planet Vespin there, and, and as he gets there for safety for himself and for Chewbacca and Princess Leia and C-3PO, they walk in there and the doors open up and who's standing there? It's Darth Vader. And Lando had betrayed Han Solo, and it, it led to Han Solo being frozen in carbonite. And, and it's like, oh man, that's a horrible betrayal. All of these film betrayals are pretty bad, but no betrayal in all of history comes close to the reality of the betrayal that happens in our passage today. It's been called the greatest betrayal in all of history. It's the betrayal of Jesus through Judas Iscariot. So if you have your Bibles open there to Mark 14, let me invite you to stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. As you're standing, I'm going to start reading. I'll start reading there in verse 43. And let me just read what God's Word says. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and yet you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And the young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Let me pray for us. Father, I'm thankful for your word, and I ask you would give grace as we hear it, Lord, help our ears to be attentive and may our hearts be hearts that the word would fall on fertile soil and bear fruit. Holy Spirit, I pray you would give unction to the words being preached today and just bless the hearing of, of your word. May we receive it and submit under its full authority. May we not be hearers only, but doers. And Father, may we grow and be molded more into the image of Christ. Bless our obedience to your word and help us not to betray and to flee and to run from Christ. Bless us to walk and to remain by your grace and full obedience. We pray this over us in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Well, this is the context that we all know well. If you've been with us the last few weeks, and last Sunday we looked at Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now he is exiting the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he exits the garden, or as he's done with praying... He, let her, he says at the end of verse 42, Rise, let us be going. See my betrayers at hand. He knows, he knows that while he's talking to his disciples, it's the moment coming where he's, about, he's, he's getting arrested. And so verse 43 tells us again, And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, 
one of the twelve. As we observe this passage and observe the betrayal of Jesus, the first thing I want us to look at to apply today is I want you to study Judas' title and his associates. His title is given to us not only by Mark, but by Christ himself in this chapter and by all of the Gospels. They call Judas one of the twelve. That's a title given to him by all of the Gospel writers. It's not one that maybe you've paused to dwell on. Of course he's one of the twelve. He's one of the twelve disciples. That's what we're all aware of. But the Gospel writers keep telling us again and again and again, it's one of the twelve that, that is going to betray Jesus. And here it is in this same chapter. One of the twelve has done it. One of the twelve. Judas is the betrayer. He was one of the twelve. And to think about that, to slow down and pause and think about that, he, he was one of the, the twelve. One of the twelve disciples. He... This man's been with Jesus for three years. He's been on the front row. He, at the Last Supper, sat closest to Jesus. He's seen all of these activities take place. He should know better than any man in all of history. He had a seat that all of the believing Christians in this room didn't have. He got to see things that none of us have seen with our eyes. And there he was, in the midst of all of that, he betrayed Jesus. He was one of the twelve, and yet he betrayed Jesus Christ. That is fascinating. He, he brings with him this crowd. We know from the other gospel writers, John 18 verse 3 tells us that Judas came accompanied by a man, a band of men and officers. A band of men refers to a Roman cohort, which numbered six, some 600 men when at full strength. So it could have been a crowd of that size coming to arrest Jesus. That's a massive crowd to take Jesus and the 11 disciples that were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so John MacArthur says about this, him being called one of the twelve, he says, especially in this context, such a simple description actually heightens the evil of his crime more than any series of derogatory epithets or negative criticisms could do. This is just one of the twelves that's betraying Jesus. And so the story of Judas always calls into question, I think every believer that reads it, wonders in their own heart, is there a way I could betray our Lord? Is there a way I could deny him and betray him? Is that possible? And you have this, this reality about Judas that's true in every church where you have folks that have been raised in the church that have been around Jesus for many, many years. But when the rubber meets the road, they step away. They do not stick with the church or with Jesus. And they are gone. And, and so there are people that depart. And oftentimes it's exciting when within the church, someone that maybe have been raised in the church has been a part of the church 40 years, has the eureka moment, the Holy Spirit enlightens their eyes and their the scales fall off and they realize, I need salvation. I'm, I'm not a Christian. I've been playing the role and I speak Christianese, but I'm not really in my heart of hearts a, a Christian. And so it's, it's been a reality in our nation over the years. We've had people that while they were preaching sermons, they became converted. And I had that happen in the neighborhood I grew up in, in Mandarin, in Jacksonville, Florida. There was this church near me. The closest church to my house was All Souls Episcopalian Church. So even the Holy Spirit works in Episcopalian churches. This preacher, that's a Baptist joke, right? It's okay. We love our Episcopalian brothers. This Episcopalian preacher, his name was Whitey Hogan. That was his name. In the middle of his sermon, he's preaching through his passage. And the Holy Spirit opens his eyes where the scale falls from his eyes. And he beholds Christ. And he understands while he's preaching, he understands he's lost. And he calls out in front of his congregation for Christ to save him. And they called a meeting after, after the message. And they basically said, well, um, our pastor has been lost, but he's been preaching all these sermons. He, he was lost. And there was a question, do we fire him or do we let him go? And someone spoke up and said, well, his sermons while he was lost weren't half bad. Maybe now they'll be even better that he's a Christian. And they kept him. And there was a great revival in that church. There were friends of mine in my high school that went to that church that came to faith because they began to hear the gospel clearly through their pastor. And he began to proclaim the gospel to them. And they came to faith. And it was a beautiful thing to see, but it's a possibility. And it's something where you need to look in your own heart and ask, could I be misled? Could I, even though I've been hanging around church and around Jesus, could I be one of those that, that falls away? And, and even though you may have a title, Maybe you're one of the deacons. Maybe you're one of the Sunday school teachers. Maybe you're one of the founding members of South Orlando Baptist Church, charter members. Whatever your title is, it doesn't matter. Are you a Christian? Do you have Christ indwelling in the throne of your heart? Is, is your life walking in obedience to Jesus? Because, friends, if you're not a Christian, I mean, why do it? Why go through all these motions? 
I understand culturally we have those pressures and we were raised in church and it's a moral thing and a good thing. But if you don't know the Lord, I mean, my goodness, why, why go through this? It's because Jesus is here that, that this is so much of a great place to be. It's because Christ is on the hearts of those in the room that I can't wait to get here and fellowship with you all. Without that, I, I would rather go to Disney or something. I mean, give me Jesus. And so we have Jesus. As you observe the betrayal of Jesus, study Jesus' title and his associates. His associates, not only does he have a cohort with him, he has the, the um, it says they're the chief priests of the temple and the scribes and the elders. As we've been working through the, the last few chapters, these are the ones raising all these questions up to Jesus, saying, Jesus, answer for yourself, you know, and he's been answering well and explaining who he is. And yet they all were conspiring the whole time to arrest him and to have him crucified. And then we see in verse 44 the depravity. The second thing I want you to do is you observe the betrayal of Jesus. Survey the depravity of Judas. Survey his depravity. In verse 44, the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man. You know, he could have just pointed to Jesus. You know, the one I'm going to point to, that's the guy. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to pat him on the back. The man I pat on the back is the guy. Uh, the one I give the little elbow thing, I'm going to give him the elbow, and that's the, that's the one. But no, he had to betray his Lord, he had to betray our Lord with a kiss. The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And so he simply could have done these other things. And, and the MacArthur Study Bible says this, in addition to being a special kind of act of respect and affection, this kind of kiss was a sign of homage or homage in the Middle East culture. Judas could not have chosen a more despicable way to identify Jesus because he perverted its usual meaning so treacherously and so hypocritically. If you're not aware of it, in the Middle Eastern culture and in many cultures in the world, including Russia, some Latin cultures, it's affectionate. It, it's a sign of brotherhood for, for men to greet each other with a type of kiss on the cheek. And it is something that is, has been done historically. Americans are not about that. They, we do not do that. If you try to come up and kiss any of us, it's like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Uh, culturally, it's not for us. But, but there in Israel, that was part of their culture to this day. It's still part of their culture. Tony Evans said his act of betrayal was vile. With a kiss, an act of kindness, an act of friendship, intimacy, he handed over the Son of God to those who hated him. And we see the depravity, the darkness in, in Judas. You know, it's, it's easy to think... Often, as we've been raised in this American Disney culture, that people are genuinely good, that, you know, people just believe in their heart. What their heart tells them to do, they're going to be all right. They can do whatever their heart says, and that's going to lead them to good stuff, and, and good things abound. What gets me every year and every month, it seems like, I get where we have that hope for what's good in people and what's right in the world, but the reality is evil exists. Depravity exists. Brutality exists. What happened on October 7th in Israel was brutal. It was barbarous murder and destruction of human life. Children, babies, women, elderly. No respect for anyone made in the image of God. But, but I, see, I see in our culture depravity everywhere. We're having in America quite a, a shift in our culture. When I was, here's the shift, one of the shifts I've noticed. When I was a kid, if I got in trouble at school and my teacher called my parents, well, let me just give you a bit of trivia here. Do you think that my parents took my side or do you think they took the teacher's side? If I even got, when I was in public school, public school, I want you to raise your hands if this happened to you. I got a paddling in fourth grade. My principal of the school gave me a paddling. How many of you got a paddling in public school? All right. When I got a paddling at school in fourth grade by the principal and I went home, I got another paddling when I got home. All right. But there's been a shift. There's been a shift in the culture. Whenever little Johnny or Susie has a problem in school and the teacher calls the parent, do you think the parent takes the teacher's side or they take their child's side? The child's side. That child can do no wrong. And parent, I'm here to tell you, no matter how great you think your kid is, your kid is a sinner. And your kid is doing wrong. But it's burning out our teachers. It's burning out. There's a shortage in Florida for it. There's a shortage in, in Florida. We've got to pray for these teachers. We've got to pray for those at work. I see depravity, though, in my own heart. And we see it in our own hearts. We see it in our culture. We see it in the world. Our own heart.
heart can struggle in its affections, we can be just as affectionate for Jesus in our souls and minutes later betray the Lord in our thoughts and in our actions. It was Chuck Swindoll that said this, Judas will forever be remembered as the most heinous traitor of all time. However, we are foolish to think that his story cannot become ours. Despite all the advantages he enjoyed as a close associate of Jesus, the promising young disciple became a Satan-possessed monster. And if we, if we think we could never become something so despicable, we have failed to heed the warnings of Scripture. That's Chuck Swindoll giving us uh, the application of Judas here. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, tells us the verse we quote often, The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so I don't know if you've had this, but I've, I've realized in my own heart, and Christ warned me of this, he warns us in the Gospels, he said, it's from out of the heart come sinful things, evil rivalries of sinful thoughts. I could be praying one minute and the next minute have a sinful thought enter my heart and my mind. And it's a constant battle to, to keep a mind that is focused on Christ. It's a battle. It's a moment-by-moment -moment battle. And so we see his depravity and survey his depravity, but we also see our own hearts and realize we can be just as evil and, and do things so quickly to betray our Lord. As you observe the betrayal of Jesus, you study Jesus' title and his associates. You also survey his depravity of Judas here. The third thing we see as we study this is we see the disciples flee. Look at verse 46 and on. And they laid hands on them and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Who is this that cut off the ear of the high priest? It's Peter. Now, a bit of history to remember this. Mark was writing this gospel as a companion to Peter on Peter's travels through the maps in the back of our Bible. As Paul was going his route, Peter was going his route, and Mark was the companion to Peter. Mark does not mention Peter by name. Why doesn't he mention Peter by name here? A couple of reasons, I think, is this. Peter was still alive, he was still traveling, he was preaching. And if the word was getting out that Peter was someone who had cut off the ears uh, of someone, you know, and was just walking around, uh, it was to protect Peter and to, to keep him, to, to be able to keep his ministry moving on. And so we see that playing out. But he took a servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. We know from the other gospel accounts, Jesus takes the ear and places the ear back onto the high, uh, the, the servant there. The name of the servant was Malchus. And I have to wonder about Malchus. I have to wonder, here's a man who saw Jesus who lost his ear, who had his ear restored. We have no history at all on Malchus. We don't know if Malchus became a believer or not. But I can imagine going through something like that and saying, well, this guy's a criminal who needs to die on the cross if it were my ear. But as we keep seeing in verse 48, Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Jesus had done nothing sinful at all ever. He's never sinned. He's never robbed. He was not a thief. He was not a liar. He was, he was sinless. And he says in verse 49, Day after day I was with you in the temple, teaching openly, and, and you did not seize me. But let the Scriptures be fulfilled. He is fulfilling at every step the Scriptures who tell us throughout the Old Testament the Messiah will come, He will die, the, the suffering servant will give His life as a ransom for many. And verse 50 tells us, And they all left Him and fled. All of them left him and fled. Not a single person st stood next to Jesus and hung around him. And then we have a very fascinating passage, verse 51 and 52. We have a nudist here, verse 51. Let's read about him. A young man followed him, a streaker, uh, with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So what are we to make of that passage? This is the only gospel where that shows up within its gospel. Who is this man? Most scholars believe that this is autobiographical. This is Mark, the author of this gospel, inserting himself into the story. A couple reasons why we believe it's Mark. Let me give you a few of those reasons. One reason is, who else would know this story but Mark, the one who was active in it? You know, that, that's one reason. One of the, the other things that tips our hat to Mark, possibly, when you study Mark, the person, you find someone who was raised a bit with a silver spoon. He was raised in a bit of wealth. His family was involved in the temple and involved uh, in different means where he was raised. They, they have a nickname for him in the early church. It's a very interesting nickname, but it says a lot about Mark. 
His nickname, no joke, was called Stumpy Fingers, was a nickname for him. That meant that he had some weight on him, which most folks in that day didn't have weight on him. That meant he ate well. And so when Mark went on the missionary journeys with Paul, and he got all the way out to Crete, he's like, man, I'm missing Kentucky Fried Chicken. I want to get back and eat my food. He leaves Paul, deserts Paul on the mission field. And because of his financial upbringing and wealth and the linen cloth being mentioned here, that was only someone that was involved in that level of society. It's another thing that tips the hat of mystery towards Mark. Now, we may be wrong. We don't know. But most scholars believe it's Mark. Mark records in verse 50 that every disciple left Jesus and they fled. Every disciple left Jesus. They all ran away. The word used is the word forsook. It meant to abandon someone or to just leave them behind. It means they fled. They, they sought safety by flight. They just vanished. They were gone. They, they were nowhere to be seen. And so as we see this warning of, of Jesus in this very chapter, Jesus had already warned them. If you have your Bible open, look down in verse 27 and 28. Verse 27 and 28. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And so he says, you will all fall away. And what happened in verse 50? They all left them and fled, exactly as Jesus described. And so Mark was written in a, in a number of reasons why Mark was written. One reason Mark was written was to be a gospel to the nations, to declare to the world that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Another reason Mark was written, though, was to encourage disciples of Jesus in their persecution. As they were going through their persecution, many believed that this story had a lot to speak to those facing persecution. And it raises the question, as you see them all leaving, what would it take for me to walk away from Jesus Christ? What would it take for me to flee? What would cause me to want to run? And so we see this background story happening as the recipients of Mark's letter are under persecution. No doubt many of them were tempted to flee, tempted to give up and to deny Christ. Say, I'm not a follower of Jesus. I, I don't know Jesus. I'm just going to go back to my old life and, and do what I did. But we see back in the verse, verse 50, they all left. They all fled. Jesus had warned them they would all fall away and they all did it. They were warned, and yet they still fled. And as I share this, you need to know this, that the Scriptures warn us that in the last days, many in our day will fall away from the faith and deny Jesus Christ. The Bible calls this in Scripture the great apostasy, a great falling away of believers. And there are two main passages in the Bible that teach about this in the end days. The first passage I want to point out to you is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul makes it clear that there will be a great falling away or a great apostasy. He talks about the Antichrist coming and he says in verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 2, let me read it out of the ESV. He says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness will be revealed and the son of destruction. And so the word translated rebellion is also translated falling away. It's the word apostasia. Uh, if you have the King James Version, it'll say in that version of the Bible, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin to be revealed, the son of perdition. And so we get the word apostasy from that Greek word. Apostasia. It's, it's the word used for falling away. It refers to a general defection from the true God, from the Bible, and from the Christian faith. Every age has had its defectors. But the falling away towards the end times will be massive. And I bring that up to bring up the, the book that I've, I've been working through called The Great Dechurching. It's a book that was given to me by the pastor at First Baptist Orlando, Florida. David Youth called a meeting of pastors. And as I went over, the author of the book, his name is Jim Davis. He's an Orlando pastor, Presbyterian pastor. He did some research on Orlando, and when he did his research on Orlando, it, it spread into a national study of de church people, people that used to be in church and now, for whatever reason, no longer attend church. And what he discovered in the last 30 years has been astounding, and it's made national news many times. Let me quote from the book, about 15% of American, living, American adults living today, which is around 40 million people, have effectively stopped going to church. And most of this declining has happened in the last 25 years. In his study, he, he caps it out at, at about 30 years. 
And in America, we're seeing it. It's the great apostasy of America, where 40 million Americans no longer attend church who used to attend church about 30 years ago. These are not folks who have died off. These are folks who have been raised in the church that no longer want to identify as Christians or attend. And so he studied them and and tried to figure out, well, why did they leave? What led to them leaving church? The number one reason when he pulled the de-churched people, why did you leave church? The very simple reason, and and it's one that we're seeing quite a bit of folks in Orlando that have done this. The 22%, the top reason why people have left church is they moved to a new community, and while they got to that new community, they never made the effort to get involved in a new church. They just moved to a new community, and they never got involved in a new church. Or maybe they visited a few churches. He was telling us at the breakfast, he's like, they visited some churches, but they could never find the church like the one they left. And they really enjoyed the one they left, and they, had, they enjoyed the pastor, they enjoyed the people, and they could just never find anything exactly like that. 15% of the de-churched cite COVID in the last three years as getting them out of the habit of attending church. 15% of the study it said COVID got me out of the habit. 13% said life just got too busy. And so I couldn't go to church anymore. And so reading through some of the numbers, let me give a few of those to you. In 1990, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America reported 5.25 million members. In 2020, it was just over 3 million. And that's a decline of 41% over those years. The Presbyterian Church USA has seen a 58% drop during the same time. The United Church of Christ is down 52% in that same time period. The United Methodist Church is down 31%. And that raises the question, what about the grand old Southern Baptist Convention? How has it fallen in the last 30 years? The Southern Baptist Convention in 1990 had 15 million members. And today it reports 13,200,000 members. It's a drop of 12%. And so it's affecting all churches. The only positive that they could see in all the studies was the Assembly of God denomination has grown so well among the Latin community that it reported about a, a stasis. It, it's holding the same. And so you have churches where members are falling away. Nationally, there's an epidemic in America of pastors giving up. There are pastors leaving the pulpits in, in records. And we're at a, a record, unprecedented level in our nation where pastors are quitting. And I was, Mike Adams and I were talking about this, just names of, of men we've known over the years that we've known as pastors. And they're no longer pastors. They're no longer not only pastoring, many of them are not even attending churches themselves as they give up. And we had a very close friend of ours that was transitioning from one church to another church. And during the transition, he made the decision to say, you know what? No, I'm I'm not going to just take on another church. I'm going to do something else. And as they've been studying pastors, they're finding pastors are struggling with mental health issues and different challenges. And it's leading to a grand exodus of pastors. And so Barna, a Christian research organization, showed that pastors are struggling with burnout at unprecedented levels. Last year in the month of March, the percentage of pastors who have considered quitting as full-time ministry within the the last year set at 42%. That was a sharp rise from about 29% just the year before. And so that's a huge jump. Younger pastors in particular have been affected by burnout. 46% 46% of pastors under the age of 45 say they're, they are just considering quitting full-time ministry compared to 34%, 45 and older. And so we see this great exodus of pulpits. There's research going into what, I, uh, what I've seen in the great de-churching of what would it take to get them back in the church. If we want to get the de church back in the church, what's it going to take? 22% said just an invitation to church would get me to visit and come back. 22% of the de church. 33% so they, they would return to seek friendships. And so if they knew there was a friend at church that wanted them to come, they would come. 22% indicated if my child told me they wanted to go to church, we will go to church. 22% of the de-church. And we've had some families return over the last few years that said, we're here because our kid, our child wants to come to church. I think that's awesome. 18% said they would return to church if their spouse wants them to go. And so we see, in, at least in our nation, a great falling away. Europe is seeing a great falling away and a great apostasy. It's not all bad news globally yet in the whole, whole church globally. Africa is seeing an amazing growth of the church. India is seeing an amazing growth of the church. China, with all of its challenges and struggles, is seeing an amazing growth and expansion still of the church as best we can gauge. And so the Holy Spirit is at work. And you know, even in Scripture, when things look like they're going to get worse and worse and worse, 
it's when John sees a, a number no man can count coming to faith. And so no matter what, God's arm will never be shortened that men cannot be saved and women cannot be saved. Uh, while until Christ returns, there's that open door for people to come to faith. So that's one passage about the great apostasy. A second passage is in Matthew 24, 10 through 12. God's word there says, And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. And he says that many will fall away. Many will fall away. There will be many that will fall away from the faith. It's becoming more and more popular in America to fall away and deconstruct from Jesus. And more and more are lending their voices into a chorus of an exodus that are stepping away. We hope that wherever you're at in your journey with Christ, that if you have deep questions, this church has always been welcome to welcome whatever questions you have. After every single service, Mike Adams and myself will be up here for at least 30 minutes or more. And we're here to answer and talk with you. We may not know all the answers, but we may know some in the room that might know the answers you need. And we would love to help you and work with you. This is not a church where if you have doubts, you can't ask them. Or if you ask a doubt, you're frowned upon. You ask a doubtful question. We welcome open questions. The truth can stand against any scrutiny. So bring it on. And we welcome you to ask your question. And so what hope is there, though, if so many are leaving the faith? What is there if Judas could be around Jesus for three years and fall away? And if all the disciples left him and fled in that night, what hope is there for me not to fall away? Let me give you some hope today. First thing I will say to you is survey those who are faithful. Look for those who are faithful. Judas was one of the twelve, and yes, he fell away. But Jesus Christ pursued the other eleven and restored them, and they were faithful to the end. And they remain faithful. So for every Judas, you might say, there's about 11 that really love Jesus. And if you're going to tell me, well, I won't go to church because there are, there are hypocrites up there. For every hypocrite, there's 11 that love the Lord in that church. And so don't leave just over the hypocrite. Amen. Amen. Don't let hypocrites keep you from Jesus. I'd rather go to church with a few of them than to hell with all of them. So, yes. All right. You also want to sense the Lord's correction. Jesus pursued those disciples that fled that night. I love the story. Mike, I love the sermon you preached earlier this year about Peter and John 21 being pursued by Jesus and restored to ministry and leadership. Jesus came after all those disciples who had him in their hearts that that were trusting in Jesus but struggling. He pursued them and he restored them. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 12 verse 6 that God will discipline the ones he loves. It's not easy when you read John 21 and you see the discipline of Jesus and Peter. He's disciplining Peter, but he restores them. And he does that to those whom he loves, those who are truly Christian and have Christ in their hearts. We have the warning from 1 John that those that go out from us, they were never truly of us. But those whom he loves, he pursues and disciplines and chastens. Perhaps you today feel that you've betrayed Jesus and you've messed up and you've sinned horribly, but you also sent in your heart of hearts Jesus has been disciplining you and gently loving you back into the fold. Do not harden your heart today. Repent of your sins and say, all right, Jesus, I'm ready to roll. Let's, let's do your will. I've done enough damage betraying you. I'm going to obey you every command from here on out. And if he can restore the 11, he can restore any of you in this room. And so since that correction, if you have been far from the Lord Jesus, you also want to seek a deeper involvement in your local church. Seek a deeper involvement. Judas was around the church. He was around believers, but his heart wasn't in it at all. And far too many people come to church and they attend and they sit in the pews, but their hearts really aren't there. Their hearts are anywhere else but what's happening in this room. And they're already thinking through, well, what's for lunch? And where are we going on vacation next? And all those different things. The Bible warns us in Hebrews 10.25, do not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Dive in, connect deeply to your church, fellowship in Christ with one another here, and have a love grow in you for those sitting around you. And then finally, yes, you want to stand firm in Christ. You really want to work on your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You want to abide with Jesus, commune with Jesus, pray and speak to Him, and grow in your relationship with Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. All of us are sinking when we get our eyes off of Christ and the waves of this crazy world that we're in. But there's nothing like getting away and just focusing on the Lord and finding that, that, that ground that He is, 
that firm rock to stand on that is the rock Christ. The, the waves and the, the mess of this world can beat against that, but they will not win. There is this firm foundation in Jesus that cannot be shaken. And if you have not found that, and you're not standing firm in it, run to Christ and hold on to Him. There is this security in Christ that the world cannot give. And praise God, the world cannot take it. So may God, by His grace, bless all of us to endure and to hold true to our Lord as we press forward. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the obedience of Christ who fulfilled Scripture to go to a cross and die on a place for sinners, in the place of sinners. For all of our sins were nailed to that cross. Everything that separated us from the Father was taken out of the way and nailed to the cross of Christ. Bless our obedience to Jesus. I pray for those that have been fleeing and running and that, Father, you're calling them unto obedience and unto your Son. Bless them now and strengthen them and may they, by your kindness, repent. Father, bless those that feel the wounds of of their mistakes and and may you heal them and cleanse them of their sin. Father, I pray for anyone in this room that's lost, that's never come to Christ at all. They've never put their faith in Jesus. Bless them to be converted and to be saved and to grow in that flourishing walk with them. May they not play the role of Christian and hang around the church for years and then die and spend eternity in hell. But may they come to faith by your grace. Father, thank you for these things and truths, and bless us to grow through them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a hymn of response to the Word of God. If you're here today and if you have any prayer needs, we'll be up front to help you.